Okay, level two. Let's get going. So we've just undone the conscience, the judge, the law, the record, the scales. So the things accusing you in your brain, you can now turn to and say you have no basis for that. So if, even if you're sitting here now and something is accusing you, turn to it inside and say, you have no basis for that because I'm a child of God, right? I'm a child of God and you are from Satan and you need to be redeemed and reformed and put under Jesus' feet and my basis is relational. And it says the law is not the basis of my my acceptance and my records are not the basis of my acceptance and the scales are not the basis of my acceptance who is Jesus Christ and he's in me and I never put him there oh if Jesus Christ is in you and you never put him there then he's dwelling with you oh so you're his home yes not bad huh I suppose it's what's called the good news um, so Level two, Jesus undoes our conscience-based approaches. A shift to the relational, Woo! away from the legal. When we look at concepts of sin and judgment from... Back up, uh, you're, you're, we're missing the glory of your slides. There we go. When we look at this concepts of sin and judgment from our fallen pagan mind, we're a long way from truth. Now, when I was in the Pente system, when I was a young believer, they used to say, the sign of the Holy Spirit is conviction of sin. And there's, there's never a worse translation and mistwisting the whole thing. It, Jesus said, when, he, when the Spirit has come, he, he's going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Spirit will tell you you've got three things wrong. Not just sin, not just righteousness, and not just judgment. You got all three wrong. Because you guys, you're running your sin, righteousness, and judgment all out of here. Right? Okay, so what did he mean? He said, you're wrong about sin because you haven't kept the Ten Commandments. No. You're wrong about sin because you don't believe in me. It's relational. He's saying, you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my daughter, you're my son, you're my daughter. And we go, see you later, Jesus. That's sin. Or, you're my son, you're my daughter, my daughter, you're my daughter. And you go, thank you, yes, I am. Sin is refusing the relationship given to you in Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You're wrong about sin because you don't believe in me. Hmm. You're wrong about righteousness, he says, because I go to the Father. Because our righteousness is our self-righteousness of trying to climb up this imaginary stairwell to get to God based around some accusing structure by which we get home. It's rubbish. Jesus says, I am from God. I'm picking you up and I'm coming home. And so, oh, if Jesus is going home, he is our righteousness and we're in him. That's a bit too simple. But it's the truth. Oh, judgment, judgment. Accuse, accuse, accuse. And Jesus said, no, no. I've come to judge the ruler of this world. Well, what did the ruler of this world put into you lot? What did the ruler of this world put into me? Put into us? Right. Jesus come to clean up that so you don't get accused as well. Wrong about sin, wrong about righteousness, wrong about judgment. Oh, baby, that's pretty good. Jesus spoke directly against our moral, conscience-based understanding of sin, righteousness and judgment. He did not condone the tree of death. In our fallen minds, we frame sin, righteousness and judgment in our conscience. We don't frame them in their love story. Right? In fact, our views of sin, righteousness and judgment are framed in darkness. Wow. It's a bit heavy, Bruce. Yeah, it's very freeing too because it means that your conscience is meant to be assisting your relationship. Wow. Okay, let's keep going.
Level 3. Reorienting and redeeming the conscience. So there's two trees in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life, and Jesus is the tree of life, and the tree of death, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As we heal, the conscience is reorientated. It does not compare right and wrong in legal terms and it does not accuse. It focuses on love, life and light and sits as a servant, not as a master. Wow, so you're saying we don't have to extirpate and nucleate, decerebralize ourselves and remove the conscience? No. It becomes reorientated to serve Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, and every conscience shall do what it's told. <laughs> All right? I like that. I'll say it again. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, and every conscience will do what it's told, which is to serve Jesus. Right? But it will do it willingly. It will. And so this thing is no longer a master. This knowledge of good and evil becomes to become an aware of what is truly good is life and love and what is evil is life without love. What is truly good is life and love, that's good, and what is evil, life without love. So your conscience then becomes framed to know life without love is evil and life with love is good. Oh my goodness, this is serving Jesus. Isn't that nice? Whoa. Let no law remain outstanding except the continuing law to love one another. That's right. Now, unlike the conscience killing life, now David Goer, um, a guy from Canada, said morality is to life. Morality is to life like a condom is to procreation. Morality is to life like a condom is to procreation. The flow of life is meant to be coming out of your bellies. Out of your bellies will throw rivers of dying water, rivers of living sewage, rivers of toxic waste. No, rivers of living water, life, and morality crimps life, which is the conscience. No, we're not going to walk in darkness. We're going to walk in life in love. How good is this? So Zoe, is Zoe flowing in love? Is, is life unfettered in love? And that's so beautiful. How much time have we got? A few minutes. I think that we probably close that for tonight. Can I just ask a point? And ask questions, yeah. I mean, you're, you're going to just, I'm going to lob a softball to you. When, when God sort of first confronts humanity and its fallen mind and it's painted the face of the, of the Father with angst and fear and shame and, and condemnation, I mean, it's amazing that God initiates this long journey of recovering and restoration with the, with the question, who told you you were naked? That's right. It's, and I just have often said, but who told you, Michael, you had to be perfect? What, what's the lie? What are those core deep lies that my conscience has drilled into me. Who told you? Well, your conscience. Could be a family system, the, could be a the conscience Christian doesn't system. doesn't tell you. It just assumes. Yeah. When you think about how it goes, it's not telling you this is the rule. It it starts from an assumption that yeah. it's it's this thing in you that is right. So all of my life, I assumed I had to be perfect. Right? I had to always win. Right? God, you're in a terrible situation. All his life, he assumed he had to be perfect. To live in his body with his being and be perfect is an impossibility. Yeah. You'd be tortured. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> but you had to win every game you played. You had to come first in every. You have to achieve. You have to do. You have to. But where's love in that? And I, and in all I, in all those things, where's love? And I was. Who told you? I mean, a friend said, "Who told you?" It's like, yeah. Where did that come from? It's, well, it's, from from our conscience. Exactly. So what we've laid out is that we've had stuck into us as part of our fallen mind. Now this is in this is in the um, first part of the gospel in the healing talks in, in that section and it's um, in I am um, you are in me and how this formed right Jesus is in the father 
you are in me and I am in you. So you, in the you are in me section, that got formed and we look at it. This is not the Christian walk. You are children, and greatly beloved children of Father, Dad, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They love you. They're so tender with you. They hold you. They hold you in your traumas. And we scream and accuse ourselves and accuse each other and beat the crap out of each other and name call each other and put each other down. They don't do that. This is not how they operate. So as we move towards deconstructing the human mind in its darkness, this is the first thing we do. Why? Because, remember, this is the one that locks. This is the one that locks. As you get rid of this in your head, you unlock. You go from fear to love. When love starts flowing, you can let dad love you. If you let dad love you, things start to move. Now, there's more to undo, and we'll do this in the next sessions. We've got to start looking at lots of things and we'll go through them. But we've, we've done the conscience tonight as a beginning. We might come and back and visit it tomorrow. But this is not something you go, oh yeah, that's nice. This is something you've got to come back and square away again and again and again. If you're taking communion and you're groveling and bowing and making sure you've confessed all your sins so you can be forgiven, we'll deal with that tomorrow. But that's not Christian. You start with the covenant that you are forgiven and things are forgotten and you know you're not worthy. But it's a gift. And you're not worthy by your performance, but you're worthy because you belong to Dad. Yep. You with me? So this is fundamental. This is not an if or a maybe. This is something you can't give ground on. All right? So if you notice it in yourself, pull it up. If you notice it in your beloved ones, gently pull it up. But don't let them accuse themselves or them accuse you. It's not God. And a footnote for tomorrow, because you sat down at the table today and you told me that First John passage about light, love, walking in light. Fellowship. That's coming tomorrow. Yeah, so can't wait to get that one. Yeah, it's, it's coming great. tomorrow. It's great. Michael, well, you have to wait till tomorrow morning oh. to get his I benefits. That's the same as every night. <laughs> Thanks to Bailey. Okay. Anybody else got a question? I was just a comment. It was a confession. I think. A curly, question. curly question. Go ahead. It just come over a little near Jack so the mic will pick it up. Um, so you were talking about uh, when you see that operating, you said to step out of it because its design is control. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if, say, family of origin operate in that system? Do you step out of your family of origin? No, this is, this is really right. Um, if, you, if your family of origin is operating in that, you start learning ways of sidestepping it and engaging. It requires a bit of sophistication and nuance. We've got a person I'm working with at the moment and um, they're able to phrase every question as an accusation. right? And they, they just phrase it. Um, so phrasing things like, um, well, um, is it is it... Is it normal that these things are like this and haven't been done? Like, you know, and you know, and and they're starting in the accusing square, and I, and I, I I respond because I'm well versed in meeting these people. But I'm saying, I don't quite understand the question. That's so good. That's so good. And they try another way. Keep going. And they try another way. Then I come back and say, Look, are you saying something like this? And we'll we'll talk more about that. And we'll be dealing with a thing called non-violent communication, in, you know, because not because non-violent because non. No, well, non-violent communication is a gift from a Jewish man, Marshall Rosenberg, which helps you avoid this thing, which is the tree of death, right? So I'll bring it out. And we'll show his book, and we'll take you through it very simply. But if you can learn to speak to each other without judgment. Right, And if you can speak and engage with each other without judgment, you allow life to flow. But look, if, if I say, look, um, Rosemary, 
Oh, you're brilliant. I think you're brilliant. If she accepts that, she has to accept it. And I say, Rosemary, I think you're terrible. Both are judgments. For me to stand on the sand, I'm not in the position to judge. If I say to Rosemary, look, Rosemary, when, you, when I look at the flowers you produce, the amount of work that goes into them, and the beauty that comes out and what it does to people, I'm just so happy. I'm talking about how I feel, and I haven't judged her. Right? The moment you, in, you put judgment into a human interaction, you bring death. Right? And we'll talk more about that, but that's why this is the tree of death at every axis. Now this thing though, the discriminator, can serve the tree of life, but you've got to stay flowing in life. And remember, when this is flowing, right, do you have emotions? They're suppressed. Do you have intuition? They're suppressed. Do you have values? They're suppressed. It's all right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. When that gets put away and you're functioning the tree of life, you're functioning in values, needs, emotions, intuitions, and you're starting to bring rich relationship. Does this make sense? We'll talk more about it tomorrow. Yeah.